Hey there, YouTube. I'm Pruitt. And this is Jim Davis. And on today's episode, we're gonna help you hone that innate creativity that bursts forth from within and talk about role playing and sorcerers on WebDM. Let's talk about sorcerers. Let's let's talk about a subject that comes from within. Comes from within. Not learned. It's uh, not bullshit. learned. It's innate. It's within you. Somewhere on the internet, I'm not sure how. I wonder why people got the impression that I hate sorcerers. Yeah, you shit all over them. <laughs> yes, that I video. just absolutely uh, took a big steaming pile all over the sorcerers. And some of the criticisms I've read are perfectly valid, and I agree with the criticisms. I'm like, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. Yeah. For instance. Not, not a lot of talk about the, the beauty that is Subtle Spell. We're not here to talk about mechanics. However, I would like to clear the air a bit. I do not hate sorcerers. I find the thematic uh, power of sorcerers to be very appealing. Yeah. The themes and the story of the sorcerer class is, uh, it, it, like I said, very appealing to me, and, and I like that. I have issues with the mechanical implementation of the 5th edition Sorcerer, and I think it could be changed. I've discussed them at length elsewhere, and even worked with some people on, on sort of in, inspired, like, extra spell lists and things like that. Thank you very much, Clay. That aside, the mechanics of the whole thing aside, what I like about the Sorcerer is, is the fact that they're innately magical. Yeah, they were born with power. Right, and I used to see like second edition wizards in this way. I used to struggle when I was playing and running in second edition of being like, how in the world would you multi-class or dual class or something into wizard outside of first, you pretty much have to pick wizard at first level. And I sort of saw wizards as a combination of, of wizard and sorcerer, that they have innate power within them that has to be honed and train through training and the spell book and everything like that. The third edition separating out those two archetypes created a bit of a dilemma for me because I liked combining the two of those things. And so looking at like the fifth edition sorcerer, what I like the most about it is that sort of X-Men style power discovery where you you have uh, you have this within you and and you're 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 born with it and unlike say a wizard uh, who has to train for years to get that or a warlock who has to seek an outside power source the the sorcerer is just like yeah i i've always been like this yes this is always my magic has always uh, been there and even if they had to train under someone to to harness their natural talents and bring them under control um, they didn't need an external source of magic in the first place. No. That's what's, that's what's strong about the sorcerers, and that's why, regardless of the mechanical stuff that, whatever, just fix it. Um, the <laughs> do whatever you want with it, jeez. The theme of it mm -hmm. is what, what ultimately makes me go like, yeah, I wish it was different, but I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get rid of sorcerers. I wouldn't yeah. wanna discourage someone from playing a sorcerer, certainly, um, because there's so much to offer for a player uh, with their uh, with their sorcerer. Well, yeah, uh, because, I mean, you have to think, like, where does that power originate? Right. right? And that's what, you know, all the subclasses, it's a different thing, whether it's wild or whatever. Uh -huh, but, like, uh -huh. for you, what, 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 what intrigues you uh, for a sorcerer, playing a sorcerer? Like, what, what's something that maybe uh, we could see in the future um, of, a, of a source of power? I, I kind of like a generic source for me, just sort of like, I, it, for a while, uh, you could kind of see it as in Divine Soul if you sort of squinted and didn't choose too many cleric things. I know that they say in Wild, the, the Wild Sorcerers that uh, if you read the flavor text for it, it's sort of like this can represent any number of inherently magical uh, uh, powers that you might have. Maybe you live too close to the Feywild. Maybe you just were, you know, were born at the confluence of of, of magical ley lines, and it, and it imparted you at a moment. Yeah. Maybe you were bathed in magical energies at a particular moment in your life, and and sort of became a sorcerer afterwards, which is something that I think can happen. Yeah. Um, why not? I could see something like let's really like make a subclass that really cranks it up in terms of what you can do with meta magic really like takes the sorcerer and goes we're not going to give them extra stuff no wings no base armor class nothing like that so we're just going to make them a better magic user mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of a subclass that i that i could uh, see getting behind um yeah, but yeah that said the options that are available um are are very thematic and and offer a lot for the role player who's looking for uh, an arcanist who has to deal with say 
a, a journey of self-discovery. Uh, or an arcanist who is on the run from from people fearing and mistrusting them because of how long it took them to gain control of their powers. And for those players who are looking for that, uh, the sorcerer is like, "Come on in. We we got everything you need." Yeah. Um, See, I, I uh, I'm sitting here thinking like I would love to play a sorcerer whose source of power and source of uh, adventure come from the same place, but for two different reasons. What if he was, while his mother was pregnant, like right in the nine mo ninth month, uh -huh. a dragon attacks the village mm. and breathes fire and burns her alive. Uh -huh. Doesn't kill the baby. Doesn't kill the yeah. And so that infusion of dragon fire, they come along and all of a sudden, it's kind of a little gross, but a baby like pops out, like, ah, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. oh my God, here's this child, and all of a sudden, they're developing. They're, they're developing these powers. They've that absorbed kind of thing. that energy, and right. now as they grow up and they learn the story of what happened to, now they have to seek out the source of their own power and deal with their own nature, right? Like, it, let's see, we're talking like a red dragon here, presumably. So they're presumably a red dragon sorcerer, and like, what does that mean for themselves? Do they see their their power as this dark? painful thing that they don't a, a want curse. to use a curse yeah. right like they that they, they would have rather have had a mother and a family and and a and a, and a, a untumultuous childhood mm -hmm. as opposed to these powers and so like it offers those those moments of like like you're saying like a cursed you're cursed with power mm -hmm. uh in some ways and and that is like rich in role playing potential and and growth right like the whole point of our our doing these series is to like let people know that that the the big draw for role playing is like to watch your character grow to to learn new things to to develop their beliefs to develop their ideals to to fail and have to recover yeah. to have to deal with adversity and overcome and that's really awesome though right like having to to learn to come to grips with a, a something you see as a curse Mm -hmm. And having to turn that into uh, an asset. Something yeah, like. I mean, and you know, in other systems, like say, like Exalted, I mean, it's kind of you could you could kind of play it that way, where all of all of those that are exalted are usually sought out because they have this power from birth that we have to like stop because they right. could destroy the world. Yeah. And so I don't know. I mean, you could you could port a little bit of that over. Uh, yeah. And and to offer uh, as a DM, offer a little bit of. Um, I mean, there's some there's some recourse that you have to deal with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just by virtue of being born. Absolutely, and and like to continue to borrow sort of ideas from Exalted that the idea that with power comes madness, and with power comes a a, a curse that that you can't exercise this power without eventually it taking a toll mm -hmm. on either yourself or others around you. And I can see you doing that with a sorcerer. I I can see it being like their magic courses through them, particularly if they're one where it's like they've always been magical. And right. it's not like an accident happened and they became magical. It's like they've always been that way. Then what, how does that affect who they are as a person? How does that affect their reactions to things, their perceptions of things? Are, are they maybe like, um, you know, someone whose who's reactions to, to different stimuli in their environment is always over the top? Yeah. And they not only have to learn to control their magic, but they have to learn to control their reactions and maybe they, they retreat into sort of like a meditative sort of uh, state where they where they gain control over themselves or maybe they're more like say the Vulcans where they've developed this elaborate sort of philosophy of logic and, and, um, and a way of making decisions and seeing the world to avoid the extremes that they know they're capable of. Yeah, yeah, that, and, that volatility mm -hmm. of their nature that mm -hmm. it's just inherent but it's also controllable. It's also controllable, and and the playing through that, particularly when you start, if we assume you start at first level, where it's like you've got the first level spells and your cantrips, you must have some control already. Yeah. But role playing through uh, a, a journey of learning to really harness that power, and as you learn to really harness it, unlocking more and more within yourself. Mm -hmm. Is, is something that you're not really able to do with the warlock and the wizard. That if you want that concept coupled with the, the arcane magic, uh, sorcerer is where, uh, it's probably where you best find that. Yeah, because I mean, if you've manifested your power from, let's say, birth, yeah. like a uh, home dude in uh, Incredibles. <laughs> right? Jack, Jack Jack? Jack Jack, yes. Yeah, <laughs> you're shooting laser beams and turning to metal and catching on fire, it's like. Right. This is terrifying. What, what do we do? Yeah, you know? and, and it could be that like that kind of person is sent to the nearest place that 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 people were where people who know how to deal with that kind of thing are sent. And so, what if your sorcerer is like raised by wizards? 
yeah. constantly butting heads with these with these nerds, <laughs> just <laughs> with their books. Yeah, with their books. They want you to read. It's like, Literally. I don't need to read. But it gets a source of conflict, right? Because one of the things about these classes is like, it, we're, we're asking the dungeon masters to think about how the class fits into their world. And and the class, uh, the sorcerer class demands the, the DM answer some questions. What are co what do the common people think about those that manifest sorcery with without any provocation or incident, it just happens, right? right? Like those who have like a dragon several generations back or a fairy lord or something like that. How do the, the common people react to that? Are they seen with fear and mistrust and uh, as dangerous people that need to be contained? Are they celebrated as touched by the divine, touched by the fantastic? And, 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 and people look at that and go, yeah, well, it's going to make life more complicated for us as this person learns to, to harness that. But what a wonderful thing right. to have happened to, to, to our child. Um, and so, like, those are questions the DM is going to want to ask. And that will inform how the player uh, plays their character. I, this is one of those where I would let the player take the lead on that. That I would let the player determine, like, well, regardless of, like, what's going on in the world, where I was from this is how the people reacted. Mm -hmm. um, and then if that's different than what the DM has decided, then it's up to the DM and the player to reconcile those two differences. And, well, and that, But here's know. my thing is that should be the way it is because then that gives a chance for character growth and character development. Absolutely. Because you're, you know, hey, you grew up and they were fine with you and everything and you walk into the world and... And the wider world isn't ready for you. Yeah, no, yeah. they're like, uh, you need to go back to a BFE with your, with a, whatever your, mm -hmm, your, mm -hmm. your hedge magic is that you... Uh, you think yeah. it's so cool. Yeah, or you can flip the script on that. And it could be that you grew up in a place where you were feared and loathed and, and the, the calamity that you brought as you learned to control these powers mm. made people resentful and mistrustful of you. And now you're in a wider world where people are like, yeah, no big deal. Yeah, hey, that's right? cool, like, there's guy. plenty of people that have powers. And, and now you're having, your character's having to deal with with overcoming that, that, that sense of always being on the outside. Um, and that could be an interesting, uh, you know, way to take your character as well as they go off on adventure and meet new people and, and, and monsters and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. the, the sorcerer really offers the player a chance to go through that sort of journey of self-awareness, yeah. learning more about themselves and, and learning more about um, the magic that they're that's infused in them. Yeah, so uh, speaking of that, learning learning about themselves, the players have options in Xanathar's like we've been covering here. Like they... They have these great little backgrounds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's go through the sorcerers. Okay. So I think like the sorcerer's one that's got like four. So like seems like a lot of them have three little uh, little sort of role playing uh, springboards that you can use, and, and sorcerer's got four. So uh, we've got first off starting with the arcane origin, and that's really like asking the player to say, where does your magic come from? The player could be like, my character doesn't know, but I know. The player could just be like, neither myself nor the character knows. Yeah, and it's entirely up to DM to sort of spring on them and let them know. But is it um, is it a, is a fantastic beast or monster or something that is the point of origin for that? Was it an event in your life that um, that suffused you with magic or something? Was yeah. it uh, a deal made by your parents? Um, you know, while 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 you were either an infant or, or had yet to be born that causes this uh, change in you. But it's worth considering that because it really is color sort of what you're going to do with the, the magic that you have. Is this a curse? Is this a blessing? Did mm -hmm. someone impose this on you? Did you choose it? Was this an accident or on purpose? That's all the different kinds of things you can think of that will inform your character's decisions and how you choose to play them. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, what I've thought about for Elvadeen, uh, my my divine soul, is... You know, somewhere in his past, one of his uh, one of his ancestors helped a planetar. Yeah, lost planetar lost a wing, therefore couldn't, or excuse me, lost a feather in their wing. Uh -huh. So the imbalance made it where they could not re-enter heaven. Mm. And the imperfection, the imperfection of it, <laughs> and this ancestor found this feather and returned it to the planetar and was thus blessed. Nice. Just, just planetar kissed them on the forehead and then returned to heaven. Mm -hmm. But later on, now you have a bunch of divine sorcerers just right. like. Walking around, spreading the love. Yeah, and it's complete surprise. It, it, it might take a couple of generations to manifest, or mm -hmm. it might be immediate. Yeah, right? Yeah. It could just be that, uh, that that this thing immediately manifests. But there's so many different ways that you can think about it, and and all of those things can be used by the dungeon master to create little side treks and side quests and things like that, or even influence the the main 
uh, the main adventure that they've got going on. What if the entity that was responsible for this is still around? What if, what if, like, let's take a look at the draconic sorcerers for yeah. a minute. Like, let's assume that for a second that draconic sorcerers are come about in the sort of the same way that like half dragons do, or you know, it's like a dragon is polymorphed into a humanoid shape and has a bunch of offspring with with mortals, and then later on they begin to manifest these draconic powers. What if your character lives in a region of the world? Uh, where there's a powerful dragon living nearby, and every draconic sorcerer that 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 it manifests, the dragon comes to collect them. Yeah, that those are part of that dragon's minions. That they are that, that the dragon looks at that and goes, "Yeah, that you're mine. You mm -hmm. don't you don't get a choice in the matter." And now there's sort of this foil, this antagonist, constantly pursuing the character as they're on the run from this dragon, or that they go, sure, sure, I'll, I'll be a dragon, I'll be a servant of a dragon, and now they're on maybe a mission for it. Um, you kind of get that pact, uh, that, that patron yeah, little, uh, little, kind of relationship with yeah. that, um, but th let's not let the warlocks have all the fun. Uh, and so you can have this kind of relationship with the source of your magic power. What if it's a force? What if it's just an arcane force, a magic? Maybe you seek out places where that magic manifests the most in order to learn more about yourself or yeah. to help harness the powers that you have. Yeah, yeah. So uh, moving on from uh, your your arcane origin, mm -hmm. let's uh, let's let's hit the second one here. So the, the the second one is kind of a reaction. We kind of touched on this a minute ago, but but it's really worth thinking about how others in the world react yeah. to to the presence of sorceress magic. So I'm working on a campaign setting right now uh, that, that I hope to use in both uh, live streams and, and for home games where arcane magic is taboo, forbidden. It's responsible for the destruction of the world and, yeah. and the remaining people on the world know that. Uh, and the druidic order which has taken it upon themselves to keep everything going long enough so that civil, the light of civilization doesn't snuff out has basically been like, yeah, any arcane magic in the lands that we control is forbidden. Yeah. And to them, sorcerers are the most dangerous of that. Because yeah, number one, books. they're innocent. So that means that you know if they catch a sorcerer, they're having to punish an innocent person. And it could be anyone. Mm -hmm. And so in the context of this setting, uh, uh, sorcerers are feared and mistrusted and, and actively sought out. Whereas it's like no one knows any wizards. No one's seen a spell book. A, wi a wizard in this setting is on their own. Mm -hmm. They got no one to teach the magic. Uh, I would imagine most people turn to warlock magic because it's like, well, we'll just contact a powerful patron and they'll just give it to us uh, in exchange for services rendered. And so, like that, it, it's very con, con, uh, contextual in terms of the campaign. But it could be others. It could be that it's seen as a blessing, or, or not a big deal, or you know, this happens to your kid, and you send them off to Hogwarts or wherever. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, okay, oh, we got a sorcerer in our midst. Uh, let's send them to a place where they can learn how to how to use this without uh, without it burning down the house. And that's going to inform a lot of how the character moves about the world, particularly like in the low levels mm -hmm. where. What, what peasants think of you still matters. <laughs> right, 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 right. The remaining two are kind of like manifestations of the magic itself. Yeah, yeah. Like how it comes about? Or? How it comes about, like what's it look like? Is, is, what they're really asking is, is someone able to look at you when you're not casting spells and tell that you're a sorcerer? Right. Do you have glowing <clears throat> eyes? Is there an air of, of arcane mysticism about you? Are your, is your hair always blowing from an unseen breeze, an unfelt breeze? All, shot, breezes, all breezes are unseen. Yeah, Thank you, you <laughs> Unless there's dirt in the... Sure, anyway. sure. Um, or, you know, do you, do you shock every person that you shake hands with? Do you like shock every person? Yeah, like storm like, sorcerers always yeah. got that static charge. I don't know. I, one of the, that's one of the things that I like the most about the shadow sorcerer is it's got that little quirks table of things like... Yeah, people have seen you got you, you they you've they've seen you take a wound, but no one's seen you bleed. Yeah, you don't bleed. Right. Or you breathed sometime last week. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Blinked or something. Bre uh, taking a breath or blink. Like the, the particularly the one where it's like you, when you're asleep, people can't tell if you're alive or dead. <laughs> This is another one that I really like. You could have that for all of the sorcerers and like using those shadow sorcerer inspirations, if you pick another sorceress option, you can kind of use those to inspire you and say like, yeah, what if my uh, draconic sorcerer is al always smells faintly of their of the breath weapon associated with that dragon, yeah. or stone for fire. Right, or what if my wild magic sorcerer just being around the house 
things just break. Like it gets a picture falls off the wall, or mm -hmm. that cup that was set down mysteriously is on the edge and is, is going to fall off. The milk just spoils. The milk just sort of spoils. The flowers wilt. Um, you know th that kind of randomness for it. Someone's hair grows a foot while you're talking to them, or something <laughs> like those kind of uh, manifestations. Again, depending on what campaign world you're in, those might be seen as uh, signs of a blessing of the gods, or they may be things that you attempt to hide. You don't want other people to find out. And then the final was a sign of sorcery. Is there something different? about the way your magic is cast. And this is one of those things where a dungeon master, ha if a dungeon master has a solid grasp on the, the, the physics of magic in their campaign world, how magic works, what's the origin of magic, how does it, um, how does it influence the daily lives of people, how do spellcasters tap into it. If you think about those kinds of things, then it could be that sorcerers are just uh, why is their magic tied to spells? That's, that's, sometimes that's the question I ask my, myself about sorcerers is like, wizards need to learn spells because they have to develop a technique for spell casting. Uh, clerics say prayers, um, you know, druids manifest the forces of nature, but what is a spell to a sorcerer? Do they understand it in the same way that a wizard or a warlock does? Are they, are they in fact learning all, like a fireball from all three is that the same fireball or is it different for those others and you're just sort of using the spells for the mechanics but the flavor of how you describe the spell being cast is completely different for um, for the three different classes. Well yeah, I mean, because like you said, I mean, sorcerers, at least to me, always seem more like X-Men or superheroes or right. yeah. you know, something like that as yeah. opposed to tracing things like a sorcerer just it just happens. You just kind do of. it. Um, yeah, the, the magic sort of almost like explodes out of you without without it being, it, it's like trying to hold a fire hose that it's on full blast. Yeah. Um, and, and I kind of like that. And in that respect, I would allow a sorcerer much more leeway in terms of like, here's how my, my magic works. As opposed to a wizard where I'm like, well, for a wizard, you know, yeah, the, the, the same gestures you use to cast that spell are the same ones another wizard used to cast it because the spell is the spell is the spell. Right. Whereas a sorcerer, it's like they can produce this effect. And it might not always look the same as when another spellcaster uses it. And that's how another way I would distinguish between the two classes uh, in terms of what their magic means yeah. for the world. So here's the thing. Do you think you could play a sorcerer who actually doesn't really understand that they are a sorcerer and shit just happens? Like they're running, they're with the party and they're like, oh, we need to get up there. And they mm -hmm. have fly on their spell list. Right. And they just know, like, I need to get up there. And First time, like their fifth level, and all of a sudden mm. they start flying. I think that's an interesting take, and I'd certainly work with a player who, th you know, that's where they wanted to go with it. I think there's you'd have to have some detachment because of the action economy and, and the way spells work. Um, but it, it, if it if it's just a matter of like describing things mm -hmm. and the reaction of the NPCs, especially if they've got something like subtle spell where the effects just kind of happen yeah. and there's no obvious location of of, of origin for it, I, I think so because I kind of like that idea, right? Where you don't quite know. Maybe the source. Maybe it's being around other people that that tips the sorcerer off that something's happening. Like a wizard or someone comes and goes. Hey, I noticed this happened. Perhaps mm -hmm. you. You know, whatever, uh, or or a cleric of Arcana uh, in the party can can sort of like help guide the sorcerer through their magical training. They're not invested in a particular form of spellcasting. They're clerics of a god of god or goddess of magic. I think also like the sorcerer who um, is out of, is not in control of their powers, where mechanically maybe nothing has changed, but the way you describe things, the way the player, uh, maybe even the player like randomly determines some of the spells that they have, mm -hmm. or randomly determines which spell they cast just by rolling on their list of, of spells that they know. Um, that can be another way of sort of modeling that without having to dig deep and make a whole bunch of new mechanics uh, to support that. Yeah, no, I, I, I love the idea of a, a sorcerer who like lets the DM or just rolls his spells randomly. Yeah. And the DM knows his spell list. And I mean, it's a little bit extra work for the DM. Yeah. But as play goes on, mm -hmm. he slowly starts to discover the things that he can do. Yeah, and it, it, it could be a situation where, um, you know, the DM has the spell list, and then of course the player will know which ones they've cast before. Well, yeah. But it could just be like, well, I, I'd like to attack this person yeah. with the magic. 
and maybe the player rolls a die to determine what spell level is being cast, right? So like if it's low levels, they're flipping a coin maybe. Uh, <laughs> but they can... They can uh, That's why you it, just roll a d10, zero's cantrip, one through nine, there you there go. There you go, boom. Um, they can re-roll uh, otherwise. And they can just tell the DM, okay, I want to uh, attack with my magic. My, my character panics. Boom, they're going to let out all the magic. Okay. They Reaches roll their D10, the yeah. reaching out with their with their magic and, and touching someone with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the player, or then the DM, perhaps, what if it's like, spells aren't even chosen until they decide to do that. Player's sort of like, okay, I'm going to attack with my magic. And then the DM knows, okay, you've got like four spells known you still haven't selected. And then the DM rolls on a table of offensive magic to see what manifests in that moment for the sorcerer. And then the sorcerer has that thing. Yeah. They, know, they now know okay, I can cast Agnesar Scorcher. Yeah. I can cast whatever. You'd have to have a lot of trust. I think a lot of players don't want to relinquish that trust mm -hmm. or, or DMs don't want to have to deal with that kind of thing. Yeah. But it could be a really rewarding experience. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, if we're talking about role-playing here, yeah. I mean, that's that's about as random because, you know, I mean, in, the, in a meta sense, you know, you're picking your spells before your character ever knows that they can cast them. Right, right? yes. And so, you know, like in X-Men, they don't ever know. It's just a situation arises Yeah. that is stressful, it's traumatic, mm -hmm. and they reach out with their, and then, oh my and God, they can happens. teleport. Right. Or they can, you know, like fire flies out and, and strikes somebody. Or right. Whatever. Right. Like, I just think that that's, that's a lot of fun. I think it could be a really fun, uh, fun concept, especially... If as the campaign progresses, you start reserving things, you're like, well, I, all right, I, I cast Burning Hands that first time, I'm gonna work on my fire magic, right? And then and then maybe the player says like, yeah, for this one spell, spell's known, I'm gonna take Scorching Ray. Yeah. Something like that, because I'm working on refining my fire yeah, magic. Yeah, I wanna focus it down yeah. into a narrow beam uh -huh, or whatever. Uh -huh. That's what you can do. You can, and you can start with the, with you know, like begin to cast the spell of Burning Hands and at the minute focus it into a tight ray of, a pure, uh, you know, burning fire. Right, right. So, what are what are maybe some some types uh, of uh, like off type of sorcerer? Like, what would you? I mean, the one we kind of just described is a little bit different. A <laughs> little than bit the normal. like that. Yeah. Um, what, I, what do you think? I like the idea, and it's not necessarily uh, off playing against type or anything like that. But it, it's the divine offspring, like a literal demigod. Yeah. And it could be that you're playing a divine soul sorcerer because of that, but it could be any of the other sorcerers as well, depending on how what god you're talking about and yeah. and the type of uh, portfolio they have. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I kind of like that, and that this character is the is the direct offspring of one of the mini deities in a Forgotten Realms, or sorry, not Forgotten Realms, but just a Dungeons and Dragons world. Now you've got a parent who's a god <laughs> that you have to deal with and all the kind of crazy things that Hera and Zeus make Hercules do. Yeah. Your DM could just go read about those things and yeah. then just mess with your character, right? Um, perhaps not having your character kill all their children and then have to go on a bunch of quests to atone for that, but maybe, right? You never know. Uh, you never know. Um, and so I think that that's kind of one way. Uh, before the Divine Soul and the Favorite Soul kind of came out, that was one of the, the concepts that I, I sort of liked for it. I kind of like the concept of someone who's like an untrained, uh, like like they started the wizard training, found out that they had this themselves, mm -hmm. they had this magic in them themselves, and so they're a very um, bookish and and scholarly sorcerer. They understand that what they're doing is is, is spell casting, and that spells are these formulas that are used for generations and generations and generations of magic users. Uh, and they have a ver they have a wizard's understanding of their sorceress magic, yeah. and 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 that lets them fill both the sage and the arcanist role yeah, in the yeah. party, um, and just kind of like gives it a bit of a twist, I think. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, we mentioned it in the last one, but that sounds a little little Jonathan Strange. A little he bit, has the power, yes. but he's using spells, and he starts studying with a wizard, uh -huh. and a little bit more scholarly, and he's bo he's bookish and you he's know bookish. That. I I I think the best way to uh, to replicate the kind of magic, because I've thought about it a bunch since we talked about it last time, is like really just have specific books that are arcane foci for a specific spell. Yeah. So it's like you need this spell book to cast fireball. You don't need an orb or a wand or a staff. You have it in your thing. You need the book in your hand to cast the spell. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how I would do it. And, and it, it keeps that sort of the, the, the usefulness of magical tomes and codices and things like that. Even for the sorcerer, 
but also gives them, uh, I don't know, it gives them a, a reason to collect books yeah. and to keep a large library of magic. Um, and yet there are those times when a sorcerer can just chunk the book out and focus on their raw magic and not have to worry about it. Um, yeah. yeah. Because who, who doesn't like to have a nice library, right? Sure. For me, the, sort of the final one is, is, a, uh, is a sorcerer who's a, a cursed magical creature or a magical creature who has become uh, humanoid uh, for a brief time period. So we kind of discuss it a bit uh, in our show about Dragonborn. The idea of, say, like a draconic sorcerer being a dragon that took an oath to live as a human for a certain period of time. Yeah. That they are, uh, or, or a bet. Right, like there, I, I had an NPC in a in a one shot campaign, a sort of solo campaign with uh, with my players, where there was a red dragon who was just a red dragon sorcerer, and the point of it was was that the player had challenged the red the red dragon and been like, yeah, I bet you can't live a year as a human, like I just bet you can't do it, you jerk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then the red dragon being arrogant and and uh, full of himself, was like I'll take that bet, mm -hmm. uh, and then now they. They, you know, polymorph themselves into a, a human, and and now it's a red dragon sorcerer. Uh, and I suppose at any time the player could, uh, if, if this was a player, they could decide to NPC their character and become a dragon again and fly away. But as long as they're a player character, that dragon is a human and will yeah. suffer all the limitations for it, and and just uh, have to manifest their draconicness through uh, through their magic. Yeah. Um, but there's others, that, lots of different monsters and everything that you can model with the various um, sorceress origins, and you can just be like, yeah, my my character is a, is one of these monsters that's taken on a humanoid form, and they have they have innate magic. Um, and uh, and they'll adventure for a while until I retire them and they become a monster again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's kind of where my head goes when I start thinking about uh, thinking about sorcerers. Mm. See, everybody, I don't hate them. Yeah, I like sorcerers. They're fun. I like them. I just I wish everybody had meta magic, even fighters. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs>
subtle to the point where you can't tell when he's doing his magic. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But it's uh, it's really great. All those are really great. Constantine rhymes with wine. 